Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to theCUBE's live coverage of the Snowflake Data Cloud Summit here at the Moscone Center in San Francisco. I'm your host, Rebecca Knight, sitting alongside my co-host, co-analyst, co-founder of theCUBE, Dave Vellante. We're talking about predictive AI, especially as it relates to media entertainment, which I think is so cool and a little creepy how well they can determine what I want to watch, what I want to listen to, things I might be interested in. Well, as an analyst, I love to make predictions, although my predictions aren't necessarily that accurate. Right, well, <laughs> you, need, you, need, you need a little help from AI. So I'd like to introduce our next guest, Vanya Josefowski. He is the CEO and co-founder of Kumo AI. Welcome to the show. Thank you. And Brian Rakuda, Executive Vice President, Strategy, Operations, and Programming at Black Entertainment Network. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you, thank you. So I'm going to start with you, Vanya. Tell us a little bit about Kumo AI. And I know the company was founded in 2021. Yeah. Why, why'd you found it? You know what, uh, in the last decade or so, we've seen this transition of the data from homegrown system into systems like Snowflake, where you can do so much more. Like 10, 15 years ago in my prior jobs, we built data warehousing ourselves. So you'll get three or four engineers and you will build something data warehouse. Now, nobody would do this today in the same mind. You would use something like Snowflake. So while the data is in there in this data warehousing and you can look at the past, you can understand what has happened because analytics is about the past, you still need to put a lot of effort to see what's going to happen in the future, right? And the stage that with predictive AI is today, with all the tooling available, is the same as the stage of data warehousing 10 years ago. You have these small teams of three to five people building stuff in-house, and we need to get it to the point where it's easy. It's a press button, and you get the predictions out. And um, that's why we founded this company. Kumo allows you to do that. Uh, you can get predictions as easy as analytics. You can write a simple SQL-like query, but not about the past, but about the future. Brian, we've certainly heard this story before from the technology industry, and every time, whether it's EDW, Hadoop, you know, big data, was going to change the way in which we interacted with data. But it's, to your point, Vanya, it's always been looking in the rear view mirror and then projecting forward. Right. Past is not prologue, we all know. Are we at the point, finally, where the industry's promises are going to be realized by customers. What's your experience been? Yeah, I think absolutely. We are looking at data in different ways than I think the industry has looked at data before to start predicting what customer behavior is going to look like, to start predicting what are the types of content that customers want to engage with. If we take a step back and think about BET's overall mission, it's to entertain, engage, and empower the black community. Data now is fundamental to us being able to do that better. If we think about kind of the entertainment segment, for example, uh, with our direct-to-consumer platform, BET Plus, we have a range of subscribers that have certain consumption habits. They're looking at certain content, but what we don't know is what are the other types of content that we have on our service that they might want to get exposed to, that they might want to engage with, that with our own, you know, with our own kind of abilities we might not be able to see and determine, but now with services like Kumo and products, it allows us to look at customer behavior, it allows us to look at engagement patterns, and it allows us to look at the, the inventory of content that we have and start making more dynamic recommendations. Can you back up a little bit and just talk about the challenges of the attention economy with so many streaming services available now, as well as old fashioned newspapers and books and TikTok, and these are the things that are competing for our attention, and just talk Talk a little bit about the challenges that that presents. Absolutely, so more than ever before, we have more options to keep our minds and our eyes occupied at any given point in time, right? 20, 30 years ago, there was the TV and there was cable and the introduction of satellite was the big thing. That was like, oh wow, this is a new way to consume. What was effectively though cable content, it was just getting delivered through a different mechanism. Right. Now, with smartphones, with social media platforms, with you know, all the different direct-to-consumer platforms, FAST, AVOD, insert another acronym, there are so many different services that compete for our attention at any given point in time. And so now, more than ever, it's more important for us to understand what do customers actually want. And not only what do they want just generally, but when do they want it? 
at different points in the day, at different times of the week, at different seasons of the year, what are the types of content that our customers want to be able to consume? And so, uh, yes, to, to your point, it's more competitive than ever, and so it's more important than ever for us to intimately understand our desires and our wants of our customers. So Vanya, what is the sort of secret sauce that you guys have that has allowed you to do this? And, and how do you, I mean, algos are plentiful, everybody can use them, it's how you apply them. But you can describe how you're different and, and why are you effective. Yeah, I mean, secret sauces are usually secret, right? <laughs> <laughs> so joke aside, I think um, at, 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 at nutshell what's happening here is that when we do predictions from tabular data as we have in Snowflake, we have usually multiple different tables and the traditional way that we've been doing this in the last 15 years is to join that data in a single table, produce signals which are called features, and then learn on top of those features. We've been doing the same thing for the last 15 years. This process, and it sounds a little complicated, it is. It's a very technical process. You need data engineering, you need data science to produce this training set. And uh, that's what it takes a long time. So why have been doing this for the last 15 years? is because relational data is complicated. It's like, how do we think about this multiple different tables? So what Kumo has done, it has brought the deep learning and transformer revolution to tabular relational data. At the core, what we do is we, we represent the data as a graph, and then we do transformers over graphs to be able to find out how to combine the signal in all these different tables automatically without human to be able to produce the predictions. Uh, the similar revolution happened in computer vision. You know, 15 years ago I wrote code that was finding edges in images and then we would build classifier on the top. And you can imagine then we use only a small subset of the image because the edges are a very small part of the image. Today we use the entirety of the image automatically without features. That's what we have done and that's why we get strong improvements over models that are built by hand and making it a lot quicker, of course. So is it math? You, you mentioned a graph. Uh, yeah. uh, uh, I would say it's a formalism that enables you to learn over the entirety of the data and not on a small summary in forms of features. Okay, so it's that visibility and then what you do, that observability space, if I can use that phrase, and then what you do with it. Right? So, yeah, I mean, in some ways we have found a way to learn over everything and get pumped everything in the network architectures to be able to use the signal entirely. And it works. It does work. <laughs> Absolutely. How, how has it affected your business? So we're still in the early stages, just you know, full, full disclosure, but one of the reasons why we're excited in engaging with Kumo is, if we look at direct-to-consumer platforms, subscription-based uh, direct-to-consumer platforms, there are two really important kind of drivers. One is subscriber acquisition, the number of new subscribers you're getting to sign up in a given day or a week, sure. you know, for obvious reasons. Yeah. But the other one is subscriber retention. Yep. And almost just as important to the subscribers you're adding is you don't want to lose those subscribers that you spent all this hard marketing work to build awareness and to get them to come on board. But once they're on board, they're really, really, really valuable. And so we are looking at all the range of levers. How we, how we found Kumo was we were looking at all the range of levers that we could pull to improve subscriber retention. If you look across all of the direct-to-consumer platforms, the Netflix and you know, Max and you name them, we're all trying to solve that retention problem because if you could solve the challenge of retention in the weekly or monthly leakage of your subscribers, actually solve a huge problem for the growth of the overall business. And so, where Kumo came in for us was, I alluded it to her earlier, but with our vast array of content that we have for our subscribers, our subscribers aren't always going to organically find it on their own. They'd have to search, you know, they'd have to go through all of our catalog and our library and identify content that they think might be appealing. In some cases, they won't even know just based upon a title or a short description or even watching a short trailer. And so where Kumo's value comes in is it allows us to look at the viewing patterns of customers at a very specific level and determine what are the other types of content that that customer might enjoy and engage with. 
We know that as our customers engage with our service more in watch more content, they are less likely to churn out. And so this recommendation engine that can empower a recommendation engine is extremely valuable to us as a result. So does that go as granular as storylines, certain celebrities that are in these kinds of programs? I mean, how, what, are, what is the data that you're actually looking at to determine what will keep those people coming back and wanting more? Yeah, so again, can't reveal everything okay. as far as all okay, that. Fair <laughs> enough, fair enough. <laughs> but we're looking at the expanse of our customer behavior and the different elements you know, of the content that they, they consume. Okay, okay. Vanya, how do you see this changing the way organizations sort of operate their data estates? Yeah, I, I, as I said before, I think every technology when it starts initially is very complex. And that happened to data warehousing, it has happened to other technologies, and then as it matures, it becomes easier and easier to use. And I think um, it will be the same here with predictive analytics, predictive AI, is that today it requires a lot of skills and a lot of times. And I think, you know, as we progress forward, it's going to become more available within the enterprise to a wider set of users and uh, to users that are not necessarily, you know, the, the highest technically skilled users. I believe that even you can use uh, Kumo. Even, even you, even Dave. Dave. So <laughs> le less, less hyper-specialized roles. I think right? so too. More Much access wider for business use. people. And, and, right? and exactly what happened with Snowflake, for example, right? I mean, 15 years ago, you had to be able to write Hadoop jobs. You need to be able to manage the cluster and everything else to figure out, for example, the sum of spend per customer, right? Yeah. In the cloud. Today, Everybody can write a simple SQL query and you get that in, in minutes and it's done. So that's the same type of transformation eventually you'll see. And, and I believe that that's going to change the organizational structure of the enterprise as well, accordingly. In the, in the, so if I may, in the Hadoop example, you had to call a services company to do it, to kind of help you do it for you. Either that or hire people. Or hire people, but, yes. but the people, if they're not available, which is the, exactly. the lack of people today, yeah. so, so are, are we, are we at that point yet, or we're we sort of in that middle ground? I mean, that's exactly what's happening today. You either hire a data science, data engineering team to solve these problems, or you hire somebody on, you know, outsourcing to, to do this for you. That's exactly where, you know, in spite of all these tools around, it's still highly technical thing to do. But the future is a more democratized, frankly, employment market too. I mean, if we are changing these things. So where, Vanya, do you see the future of predictive AI going? So, well, let me pull Kumo as a crystal ball. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you actually have the data to back it up. <laughs> exactly. I think, you know, a, a couple of years back I was at Snowflake Conference as I was really impressed by this image. There was a blue globe showing all data centers around, you know, all instances of Snowflake around the world, and there were lines exchanging information, and there were like hundreds of those around the glo globe. So it's a, you realize that this is almost like a organism, right? That's like providing analytics at scale in the world. And I feel that that's what's going to happen with predictive analytics. There will be a global system as Kuma will be around that will provide you know, millions and millions of models and trillions and trillions of predictions, uh, make it available to everybody as easy as a simple question. And you know, data will be all available, you know, the models will be there and you'll be able to ask questions to know everything. You know? I remember that graph, it was, uh, they call it, it's not this right name, it's like something like shared edges or something like yeah, that, so they, sh they show it every now and then. So and they track that, and it's growing yeah, yeah, yeah. quite so dramatically. I, I took that and I made it pink, because Kumo is yeah, the color yeah. is pink, and then <laughs> used it. <laughs> Love it. Um, you started the company just as we were exiting COVID, yeah. right? Yeah. And you did two raises in 22. Yeah. Right, before, I guess. 21 and 22. 21 yeah. and 22, yeah, before yeah. the market kind of yeah. got, got yeah. tight. So where are you at as a company now? Yeah, as a company, Kumok has been around for about two and a half years. We have an all-star team. Um, Kumo is a complex technical system. It, you know, as Snowflake, it took a while to build something that works and get to clients. We started getting revenue somewhere last year. We have ramped up really 
uh, rapidly and uh, you know we're working on expanding through our partnership with Snowflake we are one of the SPCS partners and um, you know things are going really well and we're very excited we have uh, a few clients that are, we're working with and um, moving from there on scaling. Do you feel like you have product market fit? Oh, I think that's, that's, that's really clear. I mean, just here at the conference when we show people the product, you know, universally they have like, wow, a response to it. So I think we're on a great path to have something, change the world. <laughs> you agree? Absolutely. <laughs> I wouldn't be sitting here if I did. <laughs> well, the key is retention. Uh, right. Okay. <laughs> no, we know for you, exactly. You said, right. Great. Brian, Vanya, thank you both so much for coming on theCUBE. A really fascinating conversation. Absolutely. Yeah, thanks thanks for having us here. Yeah. Thank you. I'm Rebecca Knight for Dave Vellante. Stay tuned for more of theCUBE's live coverage of the, data, of the Snowflake Data Cloud Summit. You're watching theCUBE, the leader in enterprise tech news and analysis.